This week in IT, I look at all the most important announcements from Build 2025 for system administrators, including a big security update for Windows 11, changes to the way the Windows subsystem for Linux is being developed, and announcements about Microsoft 365 Copilot. So stay tuned for all the latest. Welcome to This Week in IT, the show where I talk about everything connected to Windows, Microsoft 365 and Azure. But before I get started, I've got a quick favour to ask you. 83% of the people who watched last week's video weren't subscribed to the channel. As we go live today, we're on about 12,200 subscribers. I'd love it if we could push that up to 12,300 this week. So if you'd like to help us reach our goal and see these weekly news updates from Petri.com, please subscribe to the channel and don't forget to hit the bell notification to make sure you don't miss out on our weekly uploads. In case you missed it, this week was Build 2025, so it's the annual conference for developers that Microsoft holds. And to be honest, I didn't really expect to hear very much about Windows 11. I expected it to be AI, AI all of the way. And of course, most of the content was about that. But Microsoft did announce one big new security feature for Windows 11 called Administrator Protection. Now, they're speaking about this at Build because it's really going to affect developers in how they create applications because they really need to understand how this works because it's going to cause some compatibility issues. So what is Administrator Protection for? Well, the idea is to provide those who are logging in with a local administrator account with more protection without limiting the functionality that they get as part of that. Now, Microsoft said as part of its digital defense report in 2024 that there were up to 39,000 token theft attacks happening every day on Windows devices. Now, the problem is when you're running an application as an administrator, then you are open to more risk for that application to be infected by malware and it to get access to system resources like login tokens that Windows uses to authenticate a user when you're logged on. So let's look at this story in a little bit more detail and just remind ourselves of how security works in Windows 11. So if you log in with a administrator account, you are what is known as a protected administrator. So most of the time you're not elevated to administrator permissions, but you can easily elevate to administrator permissions if you need to do so. Now that might, might be because you need to run an application that's not compatible without those elevated permissions, or it might be that you need to perform some kind of system change, some kind of system configuration change that maybe you access through the control panel or through the settings app that also requires system administrator privileges. Now, as part of Windows 11, there are automatic elevations. So for certain tasks, you can essentially get elevated to administrator permissions without you needing to provide any form of consent. And you can actually change that, but that is the default setting. And this is all part of what's called user account control. Now, Microsoft recommends that wherever possible, you don't log in as a protected administrator, that you log in as a standard user. Now, the problem logging in as a standard user is that the only way you can get administrator privileges in that instance is with what they call over the shoulder elevation. And that means you need to have somebody with you who knows the password to the local administrator account so that you can elevate privileges or your IT department has to give you the username and password for the local administrator account, but that kind of then defeats the point because you know they know that you're just gonna use it you know, possibly to log in and do all sorts of things and that kind of defeats the point of running as a standard user. Now, organizations that can afford it will have their users log in as a standard user and then add on some kind of system from something like Beyond Trust or the administrator control that you have now in Microsoft Intune that allows the organization to centrally manage elevations to administrator level access. But that all comes at a cost, of course, and it needs to be set up 
and managed by an organization. And that's not always possible. So the idea of administrator protection is to really deal with everybody else who needs to log on as an admin or logs on as an admin, whether they need to or not, and provide a whole set of extra protections. So how does this feature work? When administrator protection is enabled, when you elevate to administrator privileges, if you're logged on as a protected administrator, essentially what happens is the application runs under a completely separate user profile. And this is now going to provide a security boundary. So they're going to use a system managed administrator account running under this completely separate profile. And that's where your elevated application will run, providing you with a lot of extra protection. And this is all going to happen with what they call just in time elevation. So this elevation only happens just before you need to use it or as you're requesting it essentially. And as soon as that application is then shut down, that you know additional privileges is then stripped away from you and you only get that elevated privilege again when you request it. Now, this is all being integrated into Windows Hello, and it's going to be a requirement so that you will essentially have to authenticate now every time you want to use an elevated application, either with a pin or a biometric gesture like you know face or fingerprints. And auto elevation is being removed. There will be no auto elevation anymore. You will always have to authenticate any kind of elevation on the device. And this is designed to also help prevent malware silently doing stuff in the background that you might not be aware of. This all sounds very well and good in principle, but it does have a few disadvantages. So of course, if they're removing auto elevation for users that are logging on as a protected administrator, it means those users are going to see more elevation prompts because you know you need to do something, you're going to be prompted to confirm that that's really what you want to do. That didn't necessarily happen before, especially with things in you know, Windows settings. So that is going to be a potential, you know, friction for people. Although, you know, I never really understand why users need to constantly change system settings that, you know, are system wide and need administrator level access. So hopefully that shouldn't be too much of a problem. The biggest issue with all of this, as far as I can see, is that because it's using a separate user profile to run the application in admin privileges, you are going to essentially have a profile where you might save files, you might save custom settings and configuration. And then when that application runs without elevated privileges, you won't have access to those things anymore. So you need to kind of decide, well, am I going to run this application with elevated privileges? And if I'm going to do that, then I kind of need to do that all of the time. Because if I don't, if I keep switching between unelevated and elevated, then access to files, settings, the registry is going to become restricted. Now, Microsoft has, has laid this out as a caveat and they're telling developers, well, you know, ideally your applications should run in, you know, user mode. They, you know, they should be running under the user's profile. They shouldn't be installed as a system-wide application wherever possible. And, you know, you need to make sure that, you know, if you're, really, really have to run an application with elevated privileges that you really think about these caveats and how that's going to affect the end user. So that's a potential disadvantage. Now, administrator protection is going to become default and switched on in Windows 11 very soon, Microsoft says. They haven't said what soon means. I expect that we'll see this become part of Windows 11 in 25H2 that will be released at some point this fall, but Microsoft not saying definitely at this point. I have mixed feelings about this. You know, I really wish that as many organizations as possible would run users under a standard user accounts. And of course, when you run a standard user account, if you're going to do over the shoulder elevation, you essentially have the same problem because when you do that elevation, you get that security boundary as a separate user profile, essentially. Uh, and that's what's going to happen now with protected administrators. 
and this administrator protection feature. So I think it's really important to understand what's the difference between a standard user account, which is what Microsoft has always recommended you should use, but most organizations or many organizations do not, and a protected administrator, which is the default kind of account when you create an account in Windows 11. Now, there are, you know, you have to really choose, you know, are you going to use a protected administrator account or a standard user account? And of course, it might depend on the user. So probably the biggest issue is for developers, because imagine they're using Visual Studio Code to develop an application. Some things in Windows just require administrator access to the operating system, like debugging features, for instance. So for these users, really, you have to let them run as a protected administrator. And hopefully this, protect, this administrator protection feature is really going to help to protect them. Now, of course, Build is a developer conference, but it's really important that system administrators understand what's going on there too. The Windows subsystem for Linux, uh, there's a really big change happening here as well. So if you remember back to the history, there was Windows subsystem for Linux version one. They Then they improved it a whole load with the second version. And they're now open sourcing that. They're basically saying, here is the code, you can have access to it on GitHub. Why are they doing this? Really to help developers contribute to the project and to move forward developer requests as fast as possible. Now, the Windows subsystem for Linux is already, already separate from Windows in that it's a separate component that you install through the Windows Store. So they kind of separated the WSL development from the operating system. So that helped to move things along faster. And this change making it open source is also hopefully going to help developers to contribute to the code and to move the development of the whole product forwards. Now, there were already some parts of WSL that were already open source, like the graphics component. Some parts of it are still going to remain closed source, like the driver for file redirection components. That's going to stay a proprietary component. And the, the Linux kernel that Microsoft uses for the Windows subsystem for Linux was, was already open source, and that's, of course, going to remain open source. So I think this is a really good move on Microsoft's part. You know, there are obviously requests coming in. The conference was about developers, and this is going to be, I think, very good for people who rely on WSL as part of their everyday jobs. We couldn't have a build conference without mentioning artificial intelligence and Copilot. I didn't want to concentrate on that too much because I know a lot of you don't have access to Copilot. It's quite expensive, but I think we all need to keep abreast of what's happening. I wish I understood what was going on with Copilot more. I've never used Copilot Studio. I've never created even a, a custom uh, GPT and chat GPT. I wish I knew how all of that stuff worked a bit more. I'm going to start looking at it uh, as soon as I get the chance. But there are two big announcements for Microsoft 365 Copilot, which I think you should be aware about. And of course, you know, Microsoft is talking agents, agents, agents. Agents, you know, they had a big layoffs uh, in the last couple of weeks. Many good people that we have relationships with at Petri also lost their positions over the last few years. So this is all really important. Microsoft is saying that 30% of all of its code is now developed by artificial intelligence. So we really need to keep up with what's happening here. So the first big announcement was something called Copilot Tuning. Now, what this is going to allow organizations to do is essentially, without much coding, it's a, it's a low-code capability in Copilot Studio, that's going to allow organizations to train AI models without hiring a team of you know, experts. So if you want to do something very specific, so for instance, you could create uh, AI models that would allow you to draft documents in a preferred style and structure, to fine tune agents for specific industry expertise, or to train an AI assistant to, to you know, generate campaign ideas that reflect their company's brand voice. This is all about fine tuning the output that you get from the language model. Now, I'm not quite sure how that differs from fine tuning you know, prompts, to be honest. I'm not quite clear about the difference between those two things. I do understand what it means to train an AI model, but what are the practical differences which you should do? Should you train an AI model? 
uh, using Copilot tuning, or should you customize your prompts and make your prompts better? You know, maybe customizing and fine tuning prompts is just more limited, I guess. But anyway, this is coming to Microsoft 365 Copilot uh, uh, in the future. And it should be something that allows you to really you know, tune the AI models to better suit the requirements of your specific organization. Now, Satya Nadella has talked a lot about AI agents and how we're all going to be managing agents in the future. And, you know, that future is coming very fast, it seems. And this week, Microsoft announced multi-agent orchestration. Now, they announced a whole load of other things connected to agents and AI. Of course, we can't cover them all in today's episode. But essentially, multi-agent orchestration is exactly what it sounds like. Imagine you've got all of these agents doing different things. The orchestration process basically allows you to configure how it is that they're going to work together. So it will allow you to configure agents to work as a team, let them exchange data, and basically divide up tasks based on the agent's expertise. And the idea is that once you've got all this orchestration set up, that you'll be able to manage very complex workflows more efficiently. So for instance, imagine you've got an onboarding process and the IT department has its agents, the HR department has agents, and you can basically get those agents to collaborate together and work as a team to complete the entire onboarding process for an employee. Microsoft is also saying that you'll be able to bring Azure AI Foundry models to Copilot Studio and use those to make the responses that it gives more relevant. So I'm looking forward to really understanding how all this agent stuff works, even in the stuff that I do every day. I think I could really probably have an agent do some of the things that I do. I have no idea how to create an agent. I've never used Copilot Studio. It's something I'd love to look into. Let me know if you have any experience with it. Does it live up to the expectations? When Microsoft says low code, is that really the case? So I know that things like Power Automate are also low code, but they're not necessarily that easy to work with either. You need a lot of experience to understand how all those logic flows hook together and to be able to troubleshoot them is also not easy. So I'd love to know how all of this stuff has gone for you if you have access to it and have been using it in your organization. If you found this video useful, I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a thumbs up because it helps to grow the channel and get the video seen by more people on YouTube. I'm going to leave you with another video now where I talk about a bit of a U-turn that Microsoft did recently on the surrounding the end of life support for Windows 10, essentially. Now they're saying they are going to support Microsoft 365 apps, but only security updates. So do check out that video. But that's it from me this week and I'll see you next time.